This week on Theater Talk... The truth is, day to day, I was 90% a theater actor. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. The Public Theater has a hit with Idiot Savant. It's directed by the eminent theater artist Richard Foreman, and featured prominently in its cast is the actor Willem Dafoe, who started downtown in the avant-garde theater world, but went on to do many notable movie worlds, most recently that really disturbing Antichrist. Welcome to theater talk. And you went all the way to Hollywood to come back to do the avant-garde. You I don't get went, away from your roots. I never went to Hollywood. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've been uh, someone that worked in New York, worked at a theater every day, hmm. and then occasionally I'd go off to do movies. And those movies kind of stacked up, and they have a different profile than theater does. But the truth is, day to day, I was 90% a theater actor. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Less so now because I parted with the company that I worked with for over 25 the, the years. Group, yeah. But this is kind of a pleasant return. Now, Richard, can you explain to our viewers what they will see if they go to Idiot Salon? You know, this is problematic for me always mm -hmm. because uh, we usually, we've often got good reviews. And uh, it's a plus and a minus because... You know, my parents never understood my plays, and they'd come to every play and say, oh, son, we well, didn't understand it, but it was great to see you doing it. <laughs> so uh, I don't want to be nasty to people. I don't want people to come who aren't going to like it. And there's a percentage of people who are more interested in normal theater that manipulates them in normal ways that will not have fun at my play, as opposed to many people who've been coming to my plays for 40 years. What you will see is my own continuing effort to figure out how a human being is supposed to use this mechanism. Huh. A sp spiritual quest, in a way. may not be obvious on first viewing, but that's really what I'm involved with. And it's a little rigorous, and it's a little demanding, so, but repl repays those people yeah. who want that. What and you have fans. Are, are, is he manipulating people in abnormal ways? <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 <laughs> having given what he said, I, I'm one of his fans. I was one of his fans before I worked with him. Um, I like sitting in the theater watching a Richard Foreman show. Mm -hmm. I like how I think. I like how I feel. And, uh, but that, I suppose, did take some tra training. And I do recognize that I, why I liked it years ago is probably different than why I like it now. And I think there was a, what do you a think maturing um, of how I related to his plays. Now, do you require your actors to understand what you're doing? You know, I have a reputation as being a very sort of intellectual director and so forth, but I assure you, when we work, we never talk in those terms. As a matter of fact, our rehearsals are usually just full of jokes, and we're just trying out doing things in different ways with no theoretical discussion. So I have no idea. So I'm curious to know, though, it's something you touched on earlier. When you get the kind of reviews, these very good reviews you've gotten, particularly from someone like Ben Brownlee, who's been a, a real champion of your yes. work for a long time, yes. does it, though, become a problem for the audience that has read that review? They have it now in their mind what only Ben Brantley's interpretation is of the play. So they're no longer coming to it completely open to it. Yes, but that's true for many, many different works of art. Uh, ben Brantley's interpretation is usually not that far off the mark, so it's a fine way to be prepared. Mm -hmm. But of course, they're coming influenced. So there, there is a mark as you see it. I mean, your play's very nonlinear, but you say, ah, this is what it's supposed to be. In other words, there is an absolute truth in a Richard Foreman play. Oh, absolutely, there is an absolute truth in it. Yes, yes. Hmm. Now, I understand from a friend of mine who watched rehearsals, and you can tell us this when you're working with him, mm -hmm. that aside from all the laughing and, and joking going on, Incredible precision and drilling, because the, the, the thing has to move like, like a clock, really. Mm, I don't know about move like a clock, but uh, Richard is very precise uh, in what he wants to see. With the sound effects going, and I just noticed that you turned this way just to get that 
sound hits at the same time, you move your head this way. Is it that precisely done? Yes, but it's a different kind of precision than you'd think. It's a precision uh, that's totally tied to R Richard's pleasure. I can't even detect what the effect is sometimes. Mm -hmm. He's really sitting out in the audience and saying, well, could you not go so slow when you do that? So you do it another way. And you're always led by... Uh, you don't know what the effect is. Hmm. So I, I approach it like an athlete or like a dancer uh, because you can't approach it in traditional psychological terms. So it's a rhythmical kind of thing? Rhythm, uh, it's task-oriented, and uh, you're trying to cultivate a relationship to the material that you may not always understand, but you have to have a, like anything, you, you start to, it, with the abstraction, personalize. Uh, your uh, dialogue with it. And that's, of course, what I want my actors to do. I want them to have a secret life that I don't know anything about. Ah, Just like yeah. they don't ask me a lot of what my secret input in the play is. You know, it's like making a big composition. Mm -hmm. We don't have a story, really, though I can tell you there's a definite arc to the play. And it might be interesting to people to know that we rehearsed from the beginning with the set with the lights, with all the music possibilities, and it's sort of like editing a film where we just try different combinations of all those elements. And you've created everything, the set, the yeah, lights, the yeah, music possibilities, yeah. and the voiceover. Yeah. So you're really, you are creating a live film. I always wanted to make theater from the time I've started making theater the way Picasso would paint a picture. Yes. You know, he does it, and that's it. Yes, but you it. still have, the, as the actor, freedom within this framework he's created to explore the character as you see it? Sure, and also even to uh, invent things in the physical action because sometimes he, while he's very precise in what he wants, there's huge sections. We don't traditionally um, block it out. Mm -hmm. You know, there is getting from A to B. He'll give you A. He may hint at B, but you participate in how to get from one spot place to another. Sure, any director will. I'm, I'm no different than any more classically oriented director who says the most exciting moments are when the actor, such as Willem, brings you all kinds of things that you couldn't possibly anticipate. That's what it's about. Yeah. Hey, well, you bring that fabulous voice. I mean, all the, just the rumbling and the growling of the voice I find so, so effective in, in, in the performance. But who invented the hairstyle? Uh, I, <laughs> yes, who's that, idea was that? That's the first, uh, that's the first, that's in the first uh, sentence of the screenplay. It's not a screenplay. You know, I did an interview the other day and I said he was, a, he was a great film director. <laughs> See? Spoken like a true man of the theater there, Willem. Hey, Richard, I, I, okay. <laughs> Richard on, your, on your website you have a very interesting description of how you first generate a play. That You, you get up in the morning, tell us about it, how, you, how you put together a play in the first place. Well, this play is a little different because this oh. play is a play I wrote. 12 years ago and always thought there was something there but wasn't satisfied and when Willem and I decided to do another play I rewrote this considerably but normally uh, I write a little bit every day and I end up with a huge stack of pages and then when time comes to do a play I'm neurotic so maybe a ye two years before I have to do a play I think well let me find an interesting page and I find a page and oh that's pretty good and then I look through this huge stack what page could go with that I find another page that seems to relate somehow, written at a totally different time. And in the end, I collage a script of 40 pages or whatever it is, and that collage then goes into rehearsal, is reworked in rehearsal, but that's how the script is generated. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask right. you, we have just a minute left though, I, can you give us a sense of what that avant-garde world, if for lack of a better term, was when you guys were starting out? Because it, it's a lost world now. New York has changed so much. The landscape has changed. Could, what was it like when you guys were young and, and beginning in New York at that time? The culture has changed and much to my regret. And when you get to be my age you usually regret the changes. <laughs> but uh, the most important thing was that uh, especially there was Soho and we were all in Soho and all the arts and all the artists were looking at the work of other artists mm -hmm. in other disciplines and there really was that sense of community that you weren't so much making theater, or making music, making dance, you were making art coming out of the same spiritual necessity. Mm. That does not exist now. You agree? I do. I mean, uh, in my experience, uh, for example, when I first started working with the Worcester Group in like 1977, 
um, and even before that, uh, I was in New York a little bit. People in the theater weren't trained in the theater. They were painters. They were dancers. They were poets. They were. They came from. Or they were car mechanics. They were. There was just a time where people said, "Yes, we can rent a storefront and try to make these things," and there wasn't. For a lot of these people I was involved with, it wasn't a career. They, they were young, they were turned on by other artists. As Richard says, they were seeing lots of different things. It was very interdisciplinary, mm -hmm. and it wasn't that self-conscious, and nobody was covering it necessarily. There was no scrutiny. Now, some of those same places are filled with people that have taken degrees in experimental theater. <laughs> uh, they think it's a career, because in and good on them because they've seen people able to live off this in some cases. Um, but it's much different. That storefront that you rented to do those plays yeah, yeah. is now given over to a banana republic. I mean, there, it's true. That, that community of artists cannot exist in a city that is the price of Beverly Hills, can it? It's a tragedy. No. But I think there's people in Brooklyn who are going to yes, argue with it's you. True. Yes, th that is true. And I w our theater, normally, not when I'm at the public, but we had our theater in St. Mark's Church for many years, mm -hmm. and we had whole teams of 15, 16 interns working on our shows, and they, a lot of them worked in our theater then, but th their orientation is in Brooklyn. But also yeah. those people, you know, a lot of the people that, you know, that that was before the internet. That was before mm. a lot of um, electronic stuff was happening. You couldn't stay home. So different people are making work different way. What's different is that kind of old fashioned, you get a space, you have a community, you serve that community, and you make your little things, and then it either spreads or it dies. Mm -hmm. Listen, it's a societal thing. We're living in a society where that kind of activity is much more difficult. I think much to the loss in this society, what's happening. Is it better to be the um, undiscovered artist doing your own thing than it is to be suddenly discovered by the New York Times and the expectations start flying and the crowds start coming? If you can sustain yourself realistically, economically, yeah. yes, it is better. But how many people can do that? Yeah. Would you agree with that? I would. Uh, acting? Oh, acting, acting. <laughs> would you give it up? <laughs> <laughs> would you give up those bonuses? <laughs> movie deals? Well, maybe not. <laughs> hey, okay, with that. I've, I, I'm not about money. I've, ne I've <laughs> never <laughs> been about money. But uh, <laughs> money's nice when you can get it. <laughs> Artists. The secret, the secret history of art in the West to be written is about how many of the famous artists that you know about in all disciplines actually came from families with money. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to do exactly yeah. Yeah. what they wanted to do. Yeah. Did you guys come from well healed I came backgrounds? not from wealthy, 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 but my father told me, Richard, when I die, you're not going to starve. So I felt I had a moral obligation to keep that in mind and to do exactly what I wanted to do rather than building on the success of like the Three Penny Opera that I did for Pap when I was young sure. and go on to do more commercial productions. And you, Will? Uh, I grew up middle class, but like all my brothers and sisters, my parents put them through school, but me, because I was an actor, they were like, oh, talk to us when you're really going to do something. So I went to school for a little while, uh, but I supported myself and all my life I've supported myself by performing with a very brief period before I, when I first came to New York doing other things like figure modeling. Well, uh, listen, I really admire the fact that you keep coming back to do things like idiot, idiot savant, because uh, I've seen you in any number of uh, the, shall we say, non-mainstream exciting mm -hmm. theater in the city. Great. So, uh, It's a great performance by Willem Dafoe and Idiot Savant, directed, created by Richard Foreman at the Public Theater until, when is it running till now, Susan? It's running until December 20th, and I hope this is not your last play. You keep saying it's your last play. Do you really mean that? I do this sense. I'm th all my ideas now, for some reason, seem to feed into this very unusual kind of film work that uh -huh. I'm doing. Oh, oh, oh. It's a new career for me. Okay, so that's all right then. We'll, yeah. we'll, we still can see your stuff. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys, for being our guest tonight. Thank thanks. you. My lord, you must tell us where the body is and go with us to the king. The body is with the king! But the king is not with the body. The king is a thing. A thing, my lord. Of nothing! There's a highly publicized new production of Hamlet on Broadway, starring the lovely Jude Law.
And we thought this would be a good time to talk about Hamlet, one of our favorite plays, with one of our favorite Hamlet experts. And we are joined tonight by Jim Shapiro, who is a professor at Columbia University, where he teaches a, a class on Shakespeare. He is also the author of a superb book called 1599, A Year in the Life of Shakespeare. That happens to be the year that Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. And full disclosure, Jim was my professor at Columbia, I hate to say it, about 23 years ago now. It's getting on. <laughs> it's straight A's, though, all the way. <laughs> um, okay, Jim, uh, I went with you to see this Jude Law Hamlet. You've seen a lot of Hamlets over the years. How does Jude Law acquit himself in this role? I thought he acquitted himself well. What is he doing? What would you say his interpretation is? Each Hamlet that I see, and I probably have now seen uh, 20, 30 Hamlets, uh, does something different than every other Hamlet. I think it's imperative for every actor to try to figure out what his contribution to the part is. And people have been handing down this role since Burbage first took it on in 1600 or so. And it's, it's actually the only Shakespeare play we know that there's a continual tradition from the first actor, from Burbage to John Taylor, through Davenant, right through Betterton, and down through Olivier and Gilgood and the others, and right up to Jude Law, uh, of an unbroken tradition of Hamlet's passing on knowledge and style and technique from one to the other. What next. did you see in Jude Law's performance that sort of specifically, what do you think he was doing? How does this Hamlet this, see the world? This was a cerebral Hamlet to me. Mm. Uh, the past few years have seen uh, a religious Hamlet, somebody torn over Catholicism. Mm. Uh, some Hamlets of about a decade or so ago were more focused on uh, Hamlet's mom and the Oedipal relationship. I think Jude Law drew a, a firm line. That's not what my character is about. I'm wrestling with a problem, and it's a problem that I have to figure out. I thought it was a, uh, a, a very taught, physically uh, uh, um, dynamic Hamlet. Yes, he was uh, certainly bounding around all over the stage. And you can, you can tell he, uh, he spent a long time preparing for the part because the lines had sunk in. So I'm listening very carefully to the delivery, whether he's just mouthing speeches that we've all been forced to memorize in fifth grade, or whether somehow they've uh, uh, sunk in. So for me, they did. There were some speeches that were better, some speeches uh, less exciting, perhaps, or that he felt because of the weight of tradition he had to downplay. L let me ask you, um, going to your book, 1599, mm -hmm. which uh, I'm told sort of every actor who tackles Hamlet now reads this book before, before they, and Jude Law read this book before he plunged in. What is going on in Shakespeare's life when he writes Hamlet? We don't know what was going on in terms of Shakespeare's emotional life any more than I would know what's going on in your emotional lives now, and I never sat across from Shakespeare, and no one who did ever recorded what he was thinking. But two things were important. One, they just built the theater, the Globe Theater. It went up that spring. So within uh, 1599, as Shakespeare is beginning to write this play uh, or think about it, and certainly within a year of its composition, they have a brand new theater. And they have to fill that theater, because 50 yards away is the Rose Theater, and that's the competition. Right. Then as now, it's, it's the theater across the street you worry about as much as your own theater. <laughs> You've got to have a hit, right? You have to have a hit. And I think there was enormous pressure on Shakespeare to come up with an extraordinary play. And he didn't say, OK, I'm going to sit down, come up with a new story, and create a great story. What he did was take a play that had been on the boards for about 10 years, and he said to himself, it's missing soliloquies, it's missing this, it's missing that. I'm going to do a gut renovation on this old play, which no longer survives, so it would be great to see what he was oh, yeah. really able to yeah. do, and flesh it out. And everybody knew that old play, but quickly forgot it when they saw what Hamlet was about. So in a sense, yes, there had to be a hit. And this was uh, indisputably Shakespeare's greatest hit up to that point. It went on the road. It wasn't just in London. By the time the first printed edition of the play came out in 1603, it proclaims on the title page, went to Oxford, went to Cambridge, and elsewhere in London. So this play, and within 20 years or so, was playing in Germany. So it was an export. It was touring. Shakespeare had hit really his Like the cats of its day. <laughs> Why is this the breakthrough play? Why is this considered the first truly psychological existential drama? You know, that, that has to do really with the soliloquies. Montaigne's writing his essays 20 years earlier. This circulated, but nobody really figures out how to take interiority and put it into a character as well as Shakespeare does in Hamlet. There, there are glimpses of this in Richard III and Richard II, 
but in the many great soliloquies in this play, he's figured out how to make us feel a character thinking aloud. Not just speaking, but thinking. Mm -hmm. I think that's always been the attraction of this play for actors and why we can't imagine Hamlet without the prince, because we're finally able to watch somebody think in an extraordinary way. Macbeth will do it, other characters will do it, but this is the first time Shakespeare does it uh, and, and almost overdoes it. You know, there are early surviving versions of this play. There's, there's the second quarto, we call it, of 1604-05, which uh, has one more soliloquy than the folio soliloquy mm -hmm. does, uh, fol folio text of 1623 does. That great one at the end of the play, how all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge. Somebody X that one out by the time the folio version was staged, either because the timing is wrong or the actor couldn't remember the lines, which I doubt, <laughs> or... But what I love about this, though, is, and, and, and this is wonderful in your book, you know, we think of Shakespeare on the pedestal, but when you're cutting out soliloquies, it's almost as if you're out of town in Boston with some Broadway show and it's running too long and you've got to take numbers That's out. And right. this, is, this is the rough and tumble of the theater in Elizabethan times. And it hasn't changed in 400 years. This play has been cut combined, conflated as they say. No two hamlets are alike on stage. No two texts that are taught in school are identical. No two productions have anything really uh, to do with the ones that are around them. It's always changing, in part because Shakespeare wrote a 4,000 line play. Yeah. And you can only really do about 2,800 lines. Mm. So you have to begin by cutting. When people say to me, oh, you know, I want the purest Shakespeare, you really don't want to sit <laughs> through a four and a half hour Hamlet. No. Why, you said before, why do audiences ruin Hamlet? Audiences, directors, all these are modern inventions, so I shouldn't say that. Elizabethan audiences came with very high expectations yeah. of these plays. But by the time Hamlet was being staged in the uh, 18th century, audiences already knew to be or not to be by heart. And when I kid around about audiences ruining Hamlet, then as now there are people in the third row reciting Hamlet even as the actor is trying to recite it. Uh, I don't envy any Hamlet, Jude Law included, trying to stand up on stage and recite the lines, watching the audience mouth the yeah. words back to him. But that's already, I mean, I don't think there's any play that you can say that about uh, on the English stage, certainly, uh, at that time. So this is part of our culture, part of our bloodstream, and has been even before it became part of the educational system. Yeah, it is interesting watching uh, this production of Hamlet on Broadway. When you come to the big speeches, the audience, you can go, oh, oh, that's what they rustle around. That's what that's for. I didn't realize that, but that, that phrase just There's that me. old joke about somebody leaving the theater and saying, you know, I, I heard such great things about it, it's just, but it's really just full of cliches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on right. that note, right. <laughs> uh, Jim Shapiro from Columbia University. Uh, the book is 1599, A Year in the Life of Shakespeare. Still out, right? It's still out. And when does uh, Contested Will come out? April, Shakespeare's birthday. Ah, very uh, good. We'll have you back. We'll Thank have you. Back. you. Thanks I'd a lot for, come back. for being our guest it's today. great seeing you both. I say we will have no more marriage. Those that are married already, all but one, shall live. The rest shall keep as they are. To another and go! This Sunday, the New York Musical Theater Festival is going to be wrapping up its sixth season with a gala award ceremony. They're going to recognize achievement from the 28 musicals presented at this year's festival. But tonight on Theater Talk, we've got my favorite performance from the festival. September's gonna drop the jaw, cause I'm going to Georgetown. Far from this crumbling street. Gonna study constitutional law when I study Georgetown and outsmart the power elite. First part the journey now to be a big attorney now. Everybody's gonna wonder how I beat the system from which I came <laughs> and received such a thing. Whenever they mention my name. Gotta get out, gotta find a way. Gotta get out, gotta get out, gotta get out, gotta find a way. Would you say to agree me? I say DC, USA. They've written, I'm spinning, gotta get busy again, cause I'm gonna die if I stay. Suit me up in a new cap and gown. I'm going to Georgetown. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to 
Georgetown. Well, don't you think it's about time? I've never been on the inside track. No cash, no connection. Working twice as hard for half the respect. When you're broken black, they can break your back and call it natural selection. Well, if you select me, you're gonna respect me, direct me, direct me, George Town. Don't you think it's about time I go to George Town, George Town, George Town? I'm going to George Town. Gotta get out, gotta get out, gotta get out, gotta find a way. Gotta get out, gotta get out, gotta get out, gotta find a way. Like it's 1963, I'm a march on DC, USA. Favorite, I'm spitting, gotta get busy getting, cause I'm gonna die and I'll stay. George Town, oh yeah. I know I'm gonna make it to George Town. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk. For their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>